Hello, everyone. On this episode of How I Stumbled Across Jung, I'm with Stanton Marlin, PhD. Stan is a clinical psychologist, Jungian psychoanalyst, and author and educator. He has written many books, and one which I like very much is Jung and the Alchemical Imagination. Uh, he has written about archetypal psychology, Stan's a co-founder of the Pittsburgh Society of Jungian Analysts. Currently, he's in private practice and um, I just can't read the rest of my writing there. Um, Stan, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but welcome. Thank you. And Stan, I wonder whether, you know, we're talking about how I stumbled across Jung how did that happen for you and uh, what were some of the turning points and what were some of the influences along the yeah. way? Well, there were many uh, over the years. I spent a fair amount of time in New York and um, at the new school and with different people there, professors there, teachers, and Jung was on my mind, although it wasn't primary, I was interested in his work, uh, Bernie Weitzman gave a class in Jung, and I've had different experiences uh, in hearing about Jung's work. Um, but I think probably the one of the important moments for me was uh, when I was in college in my last two years at Bard College, um, they had what they called a field period in which you took a semester off and didn't have to go to classes and chose to do something of your particular interest to do research on. And I discovered that uh, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzner were experimenting. They had left Harvard and they were experimenting with uh, LSD work and other psychedelic uh, substances at Millbrook in this big mansion, not far from Bard. And I was a kind of hippie kid at Bard. And, you know, there were some drug use there. They used sunflower seeds and marijuana. And, you know, I engaged in some of that and had some ideas about interest in LSD and what Larry and Albert Metzner were doing. So I decided to contact them for my field period. and. Um, Again, like I said, I was a hippie kid with really long hair and jeans and work shirts and went to Millbrook, knocked at the door and expected them to be sort of uh, less formal. And they had just come from Harvard and they still were kind of formal looking, uh, which surprised me. But Richard, what later called Ramdas, uh, said, well, come in and talk. If you're interested in what we're doing here, I'd like to talk with you. And I said, yeah, I'd like to spend some time here and, you know, see what's going on and uh, explore with you what what's happening. So he gave me this long kind of discussion period and in interview where he was asking me questions about my interests and my ideas and my thoughts. And we had a great conversation. Um, and uh, after that conversation, he said, you're welcome to join, you know, the family or come and be part of what we're doing, mm. which I did. I didn't know how long I would stay. I thought of it initially as a field period, uh, but um, I almost didn't go back to school. Uh, I was so intrigued by all the visitors they had, all the really smart intellectual people, all the really esoteric uh, people, jazz musicians, people from New York, um, philosophers. There, there were people dropping in all of the time. and. Lots they would of conversations. Come visit, lots of conversations. And they would come for weekends where they did simulated psychedelic sessions. And uh, they didn't give them the LSD, but they would do rituals where they would be opened up to different kinds of experiences, not unlike meditative and somewhat more intense in some, some respects experiences. And well, one, one day uh, I was painting a room uh, for one of the sessions, sort of wildly painting a room, 
psychedelically, and I was overcome by fumes. And uh, I was taken in an ambulance to a doctor with Richard sitting by my side. And I was saying to him, would you read me the Tibetan Book of the Dead? I want to go through the bardos because I thought I didn't know if I was dying or not dying at that point. <laughs> and Richard was there and he said, well, it's, it's all right. We'll get you to the doctor. <laughs> uh, so, Let, let's, uh, pass, let's pass on the Book of the Dead. <laughs> oh, right. But the Book of the Dead was in my mind because I had an acquaintance of it with at the New School where a Buddhist philosopher teacher uh, taught the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which was my first experience of it. And I was fascinated by it. Then when I was in Millbrook, I discovered that the Tibetan Book of the Dead was the manual that they, uh, the book that they based their manual called the Psychedelic Experience on, based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, talking about how to direct and support psychedelic experience based on that book. And so having familiarized myself with the book, I was ready to go through the bardos when I felt this experience of death-like experience. Many other things happened that I could describe in terms of what happened when I took LSD. And I don't know if I should go into all that, but let me just say that when I looked at their book based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, they said that the only people whose thoughts were broad enough to include the kinds of experiences that go on in psychedelic experiences were the Asian philosophers, you know, Asian studies, William James and Carl Jung. And that's when Jung really hit me. I thought that the stuff I had learned about Jung really made started to make sense of the experiences that I was having. And then he became somebody I wanted to pursue from so there. You started reading. Um, I, I just want to go back one second, Stan. It, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, why did you find it so fascinating? Was it the um, that it talked about different stages of consciousness? and, and yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, it really opened up consciousness and the after-death experiences or the preparation for death going through these phases and finally the idea of if you were successful you could really uh, go beyond death into a final realm of enlightenment or you could be reborn from the bardo and go back and reintegrate so it was a fascinating book mm -hmm. but Jung's thought about the book was that it was often read too literally he liked the book too and was very interested in the Tibetan stuff, mm. but he felt it really needed to be listened to symbolically, not just literally. Although with Jung, there is a tension between those two perspectives. Yeah. So when I was finished at Millbrook, I talked to Tim Leary a lot about going to study Asian philosophy. I was uh, going to enroll in analytic training but I also wanted to finish my degree uh, and degrees, which I got a number of degrees, by going to study at the East West Center at the University of Hawaii, where they had Indian philosophy, Sanskrit, uh, Taoism, Tibetan Buddhism, you know, Zen Buddhism. And so uh, he was very supportive. Tim said that's a great place to go. Uh, and uh, I think you would find it you know, valuable, I found it valuable, you know, uh, I use the Tibetan Book of the Dead writing the psychedelic manual. He also used the Tao Te Ching to write another book. So the Tibetan and Asian books were important. And so when I went to Hawaii, I studied, um, my major was in Buddhist philosophy, but yeah. I also studied Sanskrit and Indian philosophy. They had some great professors there. Um, I joined a Zendo uh, where I met Robert Aiken, who became a very well-known Zen master and met Yastani Roshi, who was a famous Zen master who came to visit the Zendo. For a while, I was president of the Zendo. Um, and uh, um, most importantly, I met 
Chunyin Chang, who wrote a book called Creativity and Taoism, and it had to do with art and poetry. And he had sent a letter about Taoism to Jung and showed me a letter Jung had written back to him about the importance of, you know, the Taoist tradition and how Jung saw it. And he gave me my first publishing opportunity where I did a review of Philip Jampolsky's book on Zen. And so there was a rich opportunity there in Hawaii. And um, I was either going to go on uh, to get my PhD uh, there or go to the University of London, where I got accepted, or go to Vishwabharati University and Tagore University in India. Wow. And it was very hard. And I decided to go to London uh, because uh, there were many people there who had an interest in similar things that I did. But I had a semester I had to wait. And while I waited, I decided to enroll in the philosophy program at the New School, which was fascinating. You know, I had really many interesting subjects, met a lot of interesting phenomenological philosophers. Uh, John Brustowski was there who taught these Tibetan courses and Buddhist courses, uh, taught with a kind of what the Buddhists would call upaya, you know, skillful means. Uh, and strangest things that would shock you out of your own structures and open up experiences that led to different perspectives. Mm. So uh, I went on, you know, from there, and there's a lot more to talk about there. But maybe one thing I've talked about before I should go back to yeah. is that when I left Millbrook, the LSD experience that I finally had, I had a number of experiences there with different kinds of psychedelics. Yeah. But after the LSD experience, which I'm writing about in a new book, yeah. uh, I had a lot of flashbacks, which were kind of like Kundalini-like flashbacks that happened spontaneously. Yeah. And um, I was told by my parents, you know, you you really should talk to a psychiatrist about this because there were strange things going on. And I was, um, you know, uh, very wide open to the psyche, you might say. Yep. And um, I went to see a psychiatrist and uh, he didn't have a clue about what I was talking about. Yeah. And I knew that there was a Tibetan monastery nearby that a famous Tibetan monk, Geshe Wangal, taught in. And I thought, um, yeah, I, I should go and talk to him. He can help me, I would bet. So I went there, and when I was going there, I thought, I better make sure that they'll accept me and not just be very simplistic. So I came in and I said, uh, hello to the monk who greeted me at the door and he said, where are you from? And I thought, where am I from? Uh, I say, I come from a high place. And uh, he looked at me in the eye and started to laugh and said, too high, too high. <laughs> so then he said, that's out, so Kevin, funny. But so characteristic of the time as well. Yeah, it really, really was. And uh, it was very humiliating, but there I was waiting <laughs> for the Geshe. And so Geshe Wangal came. He was a little short guy, Tibetan, you know, with these shining eyes. And I thought, he's, he's somebody who's going to give me good information. So I told him about my experience. And I said, I had these experiences and these recurrent flashbacks. And my parents wanted me to go to a psychiatrist. And he didn't really understand what I was talking about. And I thought I would come talk to you and find out what I should do. And he looked me in the eye and both look at each other sort of silently and his eyes illuminating. And I'm there waiting for his saying something to me. And he said, listen to your mother and father. And I was shocked. I said, oh no, listen to my mother and father, you know, like, what is this? <laughs> That's this? very anti-Western advice that he was giving. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought, listen to your mother and father. I know he must be talking about the archetypes of the mother and father. And so I started to listen to that. 
and I was able to go through the monastery and talk with him. And then I went home and I was through a period where I was listening to everybody who said anything to me with an ear that listened for wisdom, as if everyone who spoke had wisdom to say, and my own ego judgments were put aside, and it was like a profound insight into the moment of realization mm. that came from other people. And yeah. sort of like the Buddha said, you know, you listen as if every word is, uh, you know, a Buddha, a Buddha word, you might say. And can be taught by strangers or, or what comes out of someone's mouth without them even knowing that they're saying something. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for some time that happened and then things started to settle down and then I went on with my education. I went back and I got a, ultimately I uh, got another master's in psychology. I went to Duquesne for a PhD in clinical psych and I wrote on dreams. I had started a Jungian training program, a Jungian analysis. And then uh, later on in life, I was originally very interested in the relationship between philosophy and psychology. Yeah. And uh, so after years of studying psychology and training as an analyst, I went back to Duquesne for a doctorate in philosophy because I loved philosophy. And so I was able to mingle philosophy and yeah. psychology together. Stand Stan, I wonder, just as we're going on to this new period, but I want to go back for one second because, A, there's something interesting that a lot of people that perhaps, you know, from the 60s thing, if I could call it that, and, and the experimentation, a lot of people made that movement into the East, which was a, a <coughs> philosophy or whatever, but I'm, I'm, that's interesting in itself to me. But I'm wondering... Looking back, what do you think now about psychedelics? Because in, in my experience, I, I'm kind of try to find the middle way towards it in the sense that I know from my own experience that it opened up a, a profound experiences of the deep unconscious would be my, you know, or an experience of the Mysterium Tremendum, maybe I could say that as well. Yeah. But then it seems that some people are very gung-ho about it now. Um, it's almost like a panacea, you know, what it seems to me or whatever. And then some people are still, some people in the psychological community are still a little, you know, um, oh, you know, that's very bad. And Jung had his ideas and all that. So from all of your experience, where do you stand with psychedelics? Now, yeah. What do you think about it? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I don't stand um, either for or against it. I yeah. think that for some people, it opens up the soul and it serves a purpose, uh, confronts them with some of the deepest archetypal realities. And if they're able to manage it and live with it and work with it, it can help them develop. There yeah. are other people who it overcomes, makes them psychotic, uh, is real problematic, uh, is uh, not well done. Uh, so uh, I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, for me, after I had my experiences and followed up on the things that I learned from it, I didn't have any need or desire to do it again. Yeah. Uh, so I'm interested really in a lot of the archetypal world that had opened up, but my way of approaching it now is, you know, I spent time in Zen Buddhism and Tantric Buddhism. I went to China. I went to uh different Tibetan monasteries, uh, Zen practice, uh, uh, psychoanalytic training, Jungian training, my own studies. And so I just have my way. I don't take drugs anymore. Yeah. Uh, it was many, many years ago. And I'm, you know, there is this thing called MAPS. There are people who are opening up to it and they have an idea. And this is one idea that I don't know about really, but I have a sort of attitude about it, given my experience, yeah. which is that psychedelic experiences can be guided. And my experience was that if you really take a significant dose of LSD or a strong psychedelic, the only guide is the experience itself. There's nobody who can guide it for you. And there may be people who watch you or try to keep you from going crazy or jumping off a building or, you know, whatever you might do. 
But I think the experience of the opened unconscious is the guide. And there are stories I have about how my travels went with that guide. Uh, and for me, not like a psychedelic experience, but the importance of a guide has been very important in Jungian psychology, the whole idea of the daimon, wow. the experience of opening to the unknown and yeah. going beyond the ego, the death of the ego, the experience of opening to the profundity of the soul leads the way, so to speak. It, it's not a, a kind of a recreational thing to do all of those things, is it? But a meaning to open up to the soul like that. And, and as you say, I mean, that's one thing about the East, isn't it? There's a tradition of having a guide. I remember when I first went to the East that what struck me is where we in the West might look at a guru in a particular way, but there's a lot of reverence for a guide through, through these kinds of things. And it's a whole different, I mean, someone actively goes looking for a guide to help them in the in these the endeavours. And yeah. I'm sure that that's helpful in lots of the different traditions until you meet the Buddha himself and then you're no <laughs> longer there for the guide or the guide is you or the guide is... You know, so there is a, a movement where yeah. that you, you're you led into a liberation. Yeah. And that's a different kind of moment. But I'm not, I think the guide experience can be, I've had wonderful experiences with lots of different interesting people over the years. But when it came to psychedelics, the explosive power of a psychedelic experience is very hard to guide. It's the the overwhelming experience itself that you suffer through or find ecstasy in or yeah. some combination of the two, the death rebirth experience that has its way with you. And which, that's... I, which is what Jung said in a way, isn't it? In one way, like sometimes I wonder what Jung might say now with latest research or whatever, but he did say that he was concerned that people might be overwhelmed by the contents of their own, didn't he? That was his sure. thing mainly. Yeah, sometimes that's absolutely true. Sometimes the overwhelmingness can be. Jung also emphasized the experience and importance of chaos, because when we experience the chaos of the unknown, it helps to deconstruct the limitation structures from which we see just certain things. It opens them up. But then as we get reborn into a new potential, there might be growth or wholeness that starts to emerge, but it's a cyclical thing. It's not a linear thing. So the archetype of linearity and the archetype of circularity are very different ways of experiencing the kind of thing I think Jung was talking about. Well, getting back to to your studies then, then Stan, maybe, and, and also um, some of the people you met, you started to meet from there, like after that whole period of Millbrook and the East. Although you've kept the connection with the East all along, haven't you, really? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I've written about it, I think, like in uh, in the book that you mentioned, I had one essay, uh, you know, because Jung, uh, an important book for Jung at the beginning of Alchemy was The Secret of the Golden Flower, Yeah, you know, it's an Eastern text of profundity and uh, an alchemical, Asian alchemical kind of text, uh, Richard Wilhelm yeah. and Jung worked on. Um, so uh, the East has been an ongoing thread in my interests, and I've written about it at times. I've studied in different Eastern uh, monasteries and zendos and things like that. I've uh, spoken about it. I've taught about it. I've given lecture about it in China. Um, uh, the first international Jungian conference in China was in Ganzhou, China. And I visited China and had uh, gave a lecture there yeah. and uh, met uh, a lot of people in monasteries, Taoist monks. I, I met the head of Taoism in China when I went to a monastery that Lao Tzu stopped at. It was a big circular thing that uh, like a, a cauldron thing that was still there, wow. supposedly that Lao Tzu had to do with and uh, 
had lots of wonderful experiences, um, you know, with uh, the Asian studies. Um, I, I'd like to ask you about one thing, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but it seems to me Jung said something about, a, a, like, I, you know, there was such a, there's been such a movement towards the East, hasn't there? Like there was the 60s and then the movement towards the East. And it's like people wanted to live in a whole new way and something so wonderful about it or whatever. And then it seems to me Jung said something along the lines that it's kind of hard for a Western person to adopt right. an Eastern tradition or whatever. Right. What, I mean, you know, in, in, in the same way we look back on psychedelics a little bit with, with, from your experience, what, what do you say about that now? Because there, there was a phase, wasn't there, of people following a guru and wearing the kurta and pyjamas, and I know I went to India <laughs> quite right. a few times, and it was like a tremendous mimicking, you know, the burning of the incense, the right. uh, adopting the Indian mannerisms. I can see a little bit of that, but, it, of course, that wasn't the whole thing. There was no. a lot more going on than that. But... There was a lot more going on. Yeah, and that, that was one thing Jung was aware of, that, you know, to be, to have the integrity of your own soul and your own spirit where you were raised and all that, yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, that we could mimic the East and that was much less than a profound reality, uh, the kind of thing that could happen. But for some people, it really penetrated to the depths. And mm -hmm. I think both could be true. What Jung said was true for a lot of people, and yet there were a lot of people who did Eastern work who I think really individuated by virtue of doing it, not just copying it. So I don't think it was impossible for us, even though we're Westerners, to really get into the spirit and soul of the Eastern traditions. Now, I've not, I mean, I came back to my own world and, uh, you know, while I'm still interested in the East and have written about it, I did a, for instance, uh, to speak, to go back to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, when I was at the University of Hawaii, and I had a Buddhist uh, uh, thesis uh, teacher, I did a book on the Tibetan, I did a study because of Jung saying the importance of a symbolic understanding. I did a master's thesis called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, the dead, what is it called? I can't even remember. But it had to do with the art of dying and the Tibetan Book of the Dead and noted uh, Nargarjuna, who was a very profound lo logical Zen thinker in the Buddhist tradition. So I used Nargarjuna, Heidegger from the West, and Jaspers as the three people who helped me understand this death birth experience as it is shown in the right. Tibetan Book of the Dead. And so I tried to integrate, you know, in my own particular way, the thinkers that I found valuable and opened up insights into the depths of that particular work. Mm -hmm. But other works too have been important to me on Taoism mm -hmm. uh, and the tradition of Taoism. So I think it's been a mixed, a mixed experience. It's been one part of my experience, but hasn't but also been the very but also very profound, uh, yeah. a profound opening maybe, it, and it's there's so many what's the word streams in the east. Like I, I can remember, you know that thing of climbing the mountain. And I know I'm jumping ahead here a little because obviously Hillman, you and Hillman have had a, a a long relationship along the way. But it's almost like it seems to me Hillman went up the mountain for a little while and came down. <laughs> But I can remember having an experience after going to India many times and thinking maybe that, you know, behind a lot, of, behind the stream of what I was being influenced by, Raj Yoga or whatever at the time, was this idea that it was an up the mountain spirit kind of thing in the way that the world is of mire and illusion and, you know, that strong sense, but it's very much the spirit. And, and when I think of Hillman, it's like he came down back into the valley of the soul. Right. Um, it's a very, very important uh, distinction. And Hillman was not a fan of the East, but we had many talks about it. And for instance, in his important works like uh, 
um, you know, the uh, Pu'er studies and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, he ultimately talks about the marriage of the two. Yes. In other words, Pu'er Senex creates a marriage. And in you the can then throw out the spirit, can't you? And and it's like that's not in my book. That's not good either. If you kind of like, you don't want to go one too far one way or the other. Right. Although at times, Jim, like for instance, in his work on dreams, he he did um, say the about the importance of one sidedness in going into the depths and not worrying about coming back. But what you what occurs down in the depths is itself a kind of integration of soul uh, that doesn't just go back to the ego as it was, so to speak. Um, so the one sidedness is something that Hillman picked up, uh, although he always liked to say it's not that he disagrees with the returns or things like that, but for him going off into the experiment, not coming back too quickly in a heady way, uh, you know, but really going down and trusting going down and experiencing going down was very, very important to him. And kind of like the message of his Damon in my language, like, the, you know, Hillman helped me at a period in my life of, 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 of you know, understanding a deepening, yeah. you know, like yes, the very need much for a deepening or whatever. Very much. And, um, you know, I think that his writing is extremely rich that way, but when you look into it, um, well, I think in a podcast you did with somebody not too long ago, I think you sent me a copy of it, the whole idea at the end of revisioning, the deconstruction of all his theories. So he was almost like the postmodern uh, Derrida, you know, with deconstructing uh all the things that he built up for ideas which was a lot like nagarjuna too nagarjuna's logic would always deconstruct like if you say something he would say but he would give you the opposite then you'd accept the opposite and he'd say but it's not only what you said in the opposite it's both and then you say oh it's both and he said no it's neither and then when you get to say it's neither you're back close to the void and you enter the void but the void itself has to be voided, and then you're back to the start. So it's a circular logistics that serves as a spiritual deconstruction, not unlike a postmodern idea that and helps not break. A, not, not unlike what happens in the East. I mean, I haven't had a lot of experience with Zen or whatever, <laughs> but, it, you know, I, I don't associate Hillman a lot with the East, right? But yeah. he's kind of in another way. In, 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 in maybe a Western context, he's doing what some of the people in the East do, don't they? They, they do that. There are resonances. There are resonances. But he was very much interested in the, you know, in the Western history, in the Platonic tradition, yeah. would go back to that history. Yeah. But at times we've had lots of correspondences. And at one time I realized I tried to introduce him to Derrida and people I was interested in. And at one point I said to him, Jim, I says, I you know, am I really leaving you, you know, am I going in a different direction than you are? Because this is important to me. He says, no, I think you were on the same page, you know, and he wrote me these letters describing, you know, his openness. And then he got interested for a while in Derrida and people like that. So mm -hmm. his expanse was quite wide. Yeah. Uh, and what was most important about him, I think it was highly individual, you know, if we talk about Jung's individuation and his eccentricity, if you like, uh, he was a very independent thinker, I think, with creating structures to believe in. Uh, just like Jung, glad I'm Jung and not a Jungian. Yeah. Uh, Hillman was glad I'm Jim and not a Hillmanian. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I wonder whether we can you know, going back to your story for a second too, it's like, because you first did analysis with Edinger, didn't you? He was my and first, he, no, so not my first, he's my first training analyst. I had another analyst before him, then I got into training and he was my first training analyst. So I wonder how, you know, if we could maybe go to somewhere along the line of how you, you know, your thoughts and your experiences with Edinger and then how you came across Hillman or, you know, along those lines. Edinger, I 
absolutely was fascinated by. I had a tremendous transfer to him. I experienced him as a tremendously deep person, very different than Hillman, but just uh, in some way just as important to me. Um, and uh, even though I have some critic, critical thoughts about certain kinds of ways of his ideas, but I'm fascinated by his books. And I remember when I first went to him and uh, I wanted to be an analyst uh, after talking to him, I said, uh, Dr. Hedinger, Dr. Hedinger, do you think I can be an analyst? And he was just silent. I said, well, you know, don't you? It was near the end of the hour. And he said, well, Stan, well, let me think about it. And I said, oh, my God. You know, so it was uh, many days before I would see him again. And I came in and I said, Dr. Edinger, Dr. Edinger, have you thought about it? He said, Stan, he says, uh, you're, you're a very bright person and uh, smart and uh, creative, but I'm not sure you have the patience to sit in a chair for eight hours a day seeing patients. And I was crushed and I said to him, Dr. Edinger, I'm going to prove it to you. And Dr. Edinger looked at me and said, you don't have to prove it to me, Stan. <laughs> meaning that I had to prove it to myself. But I've had many, many interesting contacts with him after my analysis with him. Yeah. Uh, and uh, lots of funny stories that, you know, I've told about him because a lot of my colleagues also worked with him. Uh, you know, uh, Maury Krasnow and Lynn Cowan and uh, who else was it? Uh, Don Calshed, I believe, worked with him for a while. So uh, we had many interesting stories to share. And for the long time, he was very much uh, a guy who held a very powerful transference uh, that I had. And I remember him at one international conference when he was criticized by, uh, uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name now, about tra having a transference to Jung. Mm. And um, uh, Edinger got up and said, you know, some transferences are not to be dissolved. <laughs> so he was valuing his connection to Jung, which yeah. he was really indebted to and yeah. connected. Mm. So, but he, he, I liked his book on the anatomy of the psyche, you know, the books on alchemy, he gave Wednesday night lectures on alchemy in New York, which were very rich and ultimately became part of his book. And was an important guy. Would you say, in a way, he sparked off your interest in alchemy, or did were you into alchemy well before that? He, I, I would say that I knew a little bit about it before, but he really catalyzed it. He really, really, really got me interested in it. And uh, his book, The Anatomy of the Psyche, was a. I still find it an important book even though theoretically I have some differences from him. He's, he's, a, he's a profound, deep, deeply introverted, serious person in touch with the depths. Right. And then Hillman, how did you meet him? Because they are kind of quite different personalities, aren't they? Just from yeah, the- Very different. Very <laughs> general observation. <clears throat> I met him, uh, I told the story, I think I might've written about it or am writing about it, I don't know, but Hillman, uh, I read Revisioning Psychology as a, as a book. I thought, oh, I wish I had written this book. And I, this is a great book. And I'd like to get, I think I mentioned this to you already, but I went to an interregional meeting and I walked out of a meeting. There was a lot of political stuff going on and I, they had a swimming pool out and uh, I went into the swimming pool and there was an, a guy in there. I ended up talking to him. It was James Hillman. James Hillman had come to consider going to interregional and uh, uh, I introduced myself to him and he says, uh, what's going on in there? And I said, oh, just a lot of political stuff. And he said, Stan, everything is politics. <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, he always shocked me and stuff. But there was a lot of stories I have about, you know, our riding to cars together, going to doctors, that he was worried at one point about having cancer. Uh, he loved to buy hats. I went hat shopping with him. Uh, we went around to all kinds of places. We went to parties together and dinners and he came here. And so there was a lot of exchanges over the years, 
but he was a very different sort of guy. And then I worked with him for five years as a, an analyst before all that started. And he was terrific working with dreams. He had tremendous insight into dream and symbols. And one thing he once said to me, he says, one thing I really appreciate about working with you is that when I say something about dreams, you don't ask me to follow up and what does it mean? It's like you, you work with it. And he was extremely good with uh, symbolic materials and imaginal insights and sticking with the image and yeah. things like that, which was very, very helpful. What was uh, the dream, Stan? You were telling me the dream that led you to to, uh, to undertake work with Hillman or the analysis with Hillman. Uh, oh, that... yes. I told him I had a dream um that um i had come to him and uh in the dream i said to him something that embarrassed me which was i'd i'd like to come and lie down with you for a while and i didn't know what is that is that a sexual thing is it a what is it you know just freaked me out and i thought i didn't know but i was not embarrassed about i mean i was embarrassed but it didn't stop me from saying to him jim I had this dream yeah. and he looked at me and he said, why not come lie down with me for a while? And then I thought, oh, the couch or analysis or whatever it might mean. He was yeah. accepting me to analysis when he was near the end of doing analysis, because at a certain point he stopped taking patients and wow. was going into just his theoretical work, you might say, or his own personal work. Um, but he took me on and uh, it was a very important phase of my life. I mean, I had finished training already. I'd finished all my analysis, my supervision. I had my diploma. So the thought of going back into analysis was weird, but this was a phase that I really felt important to deepen my own further work. And, 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 really... and you kind of struck up a conversation about alchemy in a way too, didn't you? The, the... I mean, I, the way I'm understanding it, forgive, but it, it seems that your interest in alchemy has been increasing all the way along. Or, or, uh, it developed yeah. all the way along. And when Jim was working, I know Jim was working on his book, but he was putting it off and putting it off. And <clears throat> I kept saying to Jim, you know, you really ought to, that's a great book. You really ought to work on it. I like these ideas. I had read some of his papers. Uh, and then he, he asked me if I would uh, help him with it. And, uh, you know, so I said, I would love to. And uh, I started sharing material with him and my ideas and how to rearrange things, how to organize things. I wrote him many letters and I kind of was pushing them to do it. And I kept thinking, why are you? And he kept sending me letters. Oh, I can't work on it this week. And, and we had back at fourth exchange, which I'm going to include those letters in the new book I'm writing about them. But uh, ultimately, he uh, was able to put together the book, uh, find a new title for it, um, and uh, uh, just rearrange the essays. And for me, it was a whole new dimension of my alchemical interest, because mine was pretty basic alchemy, history, theory, um, you know, then Edinger, the deep symbolic meanings of it, the operations uh, of al alchemy. And then with Hillman, it became the aesthetics of alchemy, the colors of the soul. And that was a whole profound, a different dimension and insight into the alchemical work. And that played a role in our analytic work as well as in our personal friendship after that was over, many years after it was over. And when did you first publish on alchemy, Stan? I mean, when did you, you first? The first publishing I think I did was an edited book called Fire in the Stone. Mm. It was a book that Murray Stein at the time was ahead of Chiron. Yeah. And uh, Chiron published it. Uh, and it was a series of essays and it had an alchemical slant to it, although not every essay was alchemical. A number of them was, and mine had an alchemical flavor. And then I just started publishing, you know, on alchemy, a lot of essays and lectures and teaching and 
it just became consuming to me. It was my path. I think, you know, just going to the colours of the salt, because it seems to me one thing you've done is, like, the blackness, the nigrida or whatever. Is, in a way, you're working with that, aren't you? Because it's like perhaps a lot of people see that negatively or... Yeah. Well, mean, a, lot of people, a lot of people defend against the pain and suffering and struggle with the kind of things that happen in the deepest parts of life and the right. soul. And learning how to not defend against it or run from it or dismiss it or categorize it, but learning how to stay with the darkness brings an illumination from the darkness itself. And that's what the Black Sun was all about. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book on that and yeah. uh, tried to deal with all that experience. And Jim really liked that book very much. He wrote a wonderful blurb for it in the back of the book. And he really liked it and said, I wish I had read it before I had written most, I would have included more of that. He may, has a few footnotes, but uh, he was pretty much done um, with some of the writing. Um, but the Black Sun was a theme. And then I started a second theme. I realized that even though I worked on darkness and light illumination, in that book, I leaned toward darkness. Yeah. The new book deals with darkness, but it's the illumination part that I'm leaning toward. So this is alchemy in the art of illumination, the goal of alchemy. What is the goal? Where are we headed? And I'm using illumination as a as an image of dealing with that. And that's still on the book, uh, my, my writing list here. I mean, this might be a little bit simplistic, but it seems to me, again, you know, after the 60s and the 70s, the 80s, when there was lots of spirituality or whatever, but there wasn't a real embrace of the darkness, maybe, perhaps, was there? It's, it's the idea of the light coming out of the darkness. It's kind of, it was a missing, or sometimes, let's say sometimes, a missing factor in that whole thinking. Well, I think what was missing for me is that when one tried to extricate from the darkness and was sometimes successful, there would be an identification and a splitting off of the light and the darkness and a, a, an evaluating of the light and the spirit rather than the connection between light and darkness and the intimate way right. that they're so that's what I tried to do in the black sun. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do in the philosopher's stone. And it's also what I, I wrote about Jung. I did a, two other books, the one that you mentioned in the uh, Jung's and the alchemical imagination. Mm -hmm. And then I did one on Jung's uh, philosophy of alchemy, psyche and the mercurial play of image and idea. So that play of image and idea uh, also fits with some of my thinking about Hillman's sticking to the image. But Hillman also writes a paper called the Azur Vault uh, in his, um, I forget what it's in now, it was in uh, uh, his book on alchemy. It's yeah. one of the chapters. And I wrote an essay on it and gave a lecture on it at one of his symposiums. But in it, uh, it's not just sticking with the image, it's sticking with the image, but the image gives rise to an idea, something that um, Gigrish takes off on with Hegel, ending with the absolute idea. But for me, it's a circular process. Image gives rise to an idea, but the idea gives rise to the image. And so image and idea are intertwined mythos you know, an intertwined reality. And it's wow. in that play uh, that the real spirit of the goal and the rebedo of alchemy come into being for me. So what's the difference, you know, the blue, uh, again, you know, just take it as a lay question, the, the blue fire, what's the difference between the blue and the red, the rebedo? 
because <coughs> you know um the, mm-hmm. uh, anyway far away no go ahead please well it, it seems to me what you were just talking about there um i could associate that with the rubido but then you know hillman's book for example wasn't it the blue fire and 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 the you know uh so it might associate image and idea with the blue color right image and ideas associated throughout all the different stages but uh, the blue fire was uh, the collected uh, tom wrote that or helped jim work with that yeah. book but in the alchemical psychology blueness is an important stage yeah. it's one of the important stages in alchemy that follows there's an innocent virgin whiteness yeah. and then there's a blackness and a tremendous darkness and then as you work on that darkness or sort of the way alchemy works and hillman works you start to see that blackness start to turn to blue it goes from a deepest dark depressive place to a melancholic illumination that has melancholy to it and so it starts out in the richness of blueness as an idea and a movement out and then a silvering of the blue and then that silvering of the blue turns toward an albedo or towards a whiteness of intellect and idea and integration and thought but it's still then that whiteness needs to have a a yellowing a jaundice as he says Uh, something happens to that whiteness to bring it back down into the body uh, into the psychoid level through that yellowing and in that working with the yellow it emerges the the red which is a fullness of life uh, a fire of life the alchemical goal of the rebedo or the redness now instead of just looking at that as a linear jouissance jouissance is a lacanian view uh, (laughs) and i've written a little bit about jouissance in the book you're we're talking about but i think just one thing it's important to know it's not simply a linear process Ah. to look at it linear linearly there isn't that kind of evolution that whole linear thing is an archetypal view of development but circularity is another archetypal view in which these things circulate and become our very blood you know the blood of the soul you might say and the red of life and uh, that is the goal of alchemy uh, or the rebedo whatever that might mean the philosopher's stone and there's lots to say and write about that it's so much has been written and nothing final and uh, so many images millions of so them. many images the peacock's tail yes that's another version of it with many eyes and <laughs> multiplicities and so there are lots of great archetypal images in alchemy and different understandings of them. And uh, for me, it's a very rich field uh, to work in. I think the way that it it brings back to the physical again, in in, in my experience, you know, the way it kind of connects spirit and matter um, is a very important thing about it. Very important. But the question, the interesting question is, and I, I work with some somatic therapists and people who really emphasize the importance of the body, and, and I think the, that's very important. Mm. But when you got the idea of linking spirit and matter, then the two are not simply divided. The two are interconnected in some sense of wholeness mm. that can't be limited or reduced to either one or even to two together, because when they're together, we break the numbers apart. We're no longer mathematizing it. We're no longer ego and otherness. Something happens that releases us from the way of thinking that breaks the world in a Cartesian separation. And it's a profundity that's very hard to describe. But it's not just this and that it's something yeah, yeah. transformed and after all this time so you know I, I, 
I, we're probably getting close towards our time, but how but, has your thinking changed about Carl Jung? Um, you know, <coughs> Millwood, um, all those years ago, first being introduced. Yeah. What, what now? I went through a phase um, where uh, I was uh, considered uh, to be post-Jungian. And the way I would think about it in the post days, I don't think we're post-Jungian yet. I don't think we've caught up to you. I still think there are lots of reading of Jung that's necessary to do and understanding him, ways of understanding. Yes, there are important critiques and historical critiques, all of value. But Jung had said some tremendously profound things that I don't think we simply step beyond easily. And um, I still value Jung tremendously. I still feel like I've got a lot to learn from Jung. I still feel like I'm working on it. And um, I feel if anything, uh, rather than being a post-Jungian, I'm a kind of pre-Jungian or catching up, to, trying to catch up to Jung, even though I have what's called some post-Jungian ideas. And, you know, I'm not just dogmatically a Jungian. I have lots of other things that interest me and lots of other people who influence me. But Jung is a core, central, important figure that I still find have a great mystery uh, to him and important to me. And how do you handle uh, the politics between the so-called Jungians and the post? How do you keep everyone happy, Stan, along the way? I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> But I am interested in a lot of things people produce. You know, I'm on thesis committees and people write things and critiques of Jung. And I, I, I value certain critiques and I value people trying to individuate, to think their own way. That's what Jung said. Don't be a Jungian, you know, you know, be an individual, individuate. And so in that sense, I think we're post Jungian if we're Jungian. <laughs> it brings them together. You know, that Jung valued very much the independence of who we are, how we think, and yeah. that's what he forwarded, and I value that. Yeah, for sure. And and just before we go, Stan, one last thing. I wonder if you could, I know you're writing a book about it, but tell us a little bit about your study and, uh, uh, you know, what you're writing about it. And also maybe that story uh, you were telling me about Hillman, uh, and his grandfather's. Right. Well, I wrote about that in uh, Archetypal Psychologies, but I'm writing about it again uh, in, in his book, yeah. uh, in the on him. Uh, I'll be using it and elaborating it and amplifying it a little bit. Um, I, um, I find that the work that probably is most engaging at the moment, because I haven't really entered the, the book on Hillman yet very far, mm. uh, but I've been working for years on this Philosopher's Stone book. Mm. And in it, I'm including a lot of different philosophers, a lot of different analysts, uh, a lot of work on Jung, a lot of work on Balkany. Uh, I'm linking the two um, and um, uh, trying to read myself and follow up with where I left off so that I can forward my own thought. And maybe one of the elements that's coming into that I've always been interested in uh, and um, is going to have a place in this is esotericism, the occult and magic as part of the psychic realities that emerge when you open up into an archetypal world, the right. place that that has. And there's some really good literature and some good people who have proved you know, put out some pretty profound and interesting things that I'm integrating into the work that I do and find fascinating and interesting. But it's core Jung, Hillman, archetypal psychology, and me, what I think mm. is hopefully what comes out. And what is the goal? You know, what is the goal? That's the question. And mm. so I'll be trying to approach such a question. Are you into Neoplatonism as well? Is that a, an interest of yours? Is that when you talk about the occult and mystery and magic, are you 
are, are you kind of aligned to that kind of thinking or do you have a whole range of influences in, in all of that? Well, the, I mean, the occult has a whole tradition of its own, you know, the history of occult and magic uh, stuff. And there's a whole world of things out there and publishers and I'm reading books and have studied with and have practiced, you know, uh, with people. Um, so there will be an inclusion of that. I've done some study of Crowley and people like that uh, did some of the investigations of that kind of stuff. Uh, had some interesting dreams about Crowley and my relationship to him. Uh, so dreams have been an important part of my work uh, and we'll include some of those. I also have some interesting case studies uh, um, about a, a priest who uh, is leaving a monastery, uh, a physician who's had a tremendous experience uh, working with dreams. Uh, he's, um, you know, a neurologist. Uh, so I have about three or four or five different case studies, a number of different esoteric occult thinkers I'm including in the book, uh, again, back to alchemy and the goals of alchemy and some of the literature in alchemy that I haven't touched so far. Some of the interesting philosophers, starting with Heidegger and some of Heidegger's criti critics and some of the issues with Heidegger. Uh, but there's some really interesting stuff that certain philosophers are doing on the poesis, just like Hillman talks about the poesis. There's some philosophers who talk about theopoesis now and about the whole meaning of going through and beyond the world that we know headed toward a mysterium tremendum. And I would include it with that a mysterium conjunctionis like Jung did, the tension between the two. And so I'm trying to work on all that stuff and it's taken me a very long time not so surprising I hope, <laughs> hope to finish it up <laughs> at least thanks. the book yes thanks dan that's uh, wonderful to hear about all all of uh, what you're doing there and um i love reading your material so uh, you know thank, thank, you. You. thank you for the interview and for your interest pleasure See you later.